Since the late 1970s, when Australia learned that the shimmer surrounding the All Blacks was the shimmer of quality, not invincibility, we've had a close and fierce rivalry with our nearest rugby neighbour. The best academic exam in World Rugby will always be playing against New Zealand sides. They are relentless, they are remorseless, they do not forgive. To go into a New Zealand dressing room after a match to thank them for the game as the victor is, is perhaps one of the great joys of rugby. It's possibly because it doesn't happen very often. The referee would go, at the start of a game, he'd go, uh, gold ball. And I would always say to the referee, look, let's get this sorted out right from the beginning. We're black, they're yellow. Australia's rugby team, the Wallabies, returned victorious from the Grand Slam Tour of 1984 and were looking for the victory that would cement their place atop the rugby world. In 1985, in a one-off test, they missed by a single point, a chance to defeat the All Blacks. So 1986 and the tour by the Wallabies to New Zealand would be the chance to at last snatch the crown of unofficial world champions. I knew that we had never beaten New Zealand in New Zealand with a first string side. We'd beaten them in the 40s when two of New Zealand teams were in South Africa and our best side was um, most probably depleted. And, he, and no one's done that since. And unfortunately, we don't have these tours. And it was a very grinding tour and they pitted us against the best. My aim was to go through the tour unbeaten. I didn't share that with the players, but I prepared that way. But I knew we were up against it and it was a very, very tough tour. In truth, the All Blacks were in turmoil. Their great desire was to defeat South Africa in a series on the Springboks' home soil, a feat they had never managed. A sanction tour was prevented at the last moment by court action in 1985, but so great was the New Zealanders' desire to do battle with South Africa that an unsanctioned tour went there early in 1986. The Rebel Cavaliers, as they were known, were banned for two tests. The Baby Blacks, who took their place, played France and won then faced Australia in the first test of the crucial 1986 series. Bar Jones, still going. Campisi, yes! 20th try in a test match for Campisi. First points for Australia. There was a huge wind at Wellington and we played with it in the first half and I just didn't think we had enough points. But uh, we turned around and I can remember Nick Far Jones playing a, a fantastic game at, at halfback because playing into the wind at fly half, I didn't particularly want the ball because if I tried to kick it, it'd go backwards. And uh, but Nick just kept probing the short side. 22 metre line. Far Jones to Lawton, the only man on the blind side. Now they go again. Papworth, Campisi. <laughs> yes, that was the t test where Campo scored two tries, one for us and one for them. A wall of gold jerseys. And finally, Kirk over halfway to Campisi. Terry Wright, the tackler. Long pass, dangerous. Joe Stanley for the line. Joe Stanley, great tackle. Brooke Cowden! Well, it came from a suicide just one of those things you just want to go home. You know, it's probably a bit of a sook, but um, when things don't go your way and, you know, you just feel down, but, you know, luckily for me, I stayed on. I was part of the team to win. Liner was a genius on that day because we had a million and one 22 dropouts and Liner only had to knock one short and they would have smacked a penalty goal over. Michael Spate to Kirk. Went for a drop goal, but that one well wide. That was very ambitious from the New Zealand skipper. I don't know what was in his veins, but it's not what flows in yours and mine. Just a super young man. Only a one-point margin, and the baby blacks had not disgraced themselves. Some of them, let me tell you, weren't, weren't babies. They were, they were quite good rugby players and went on to become great rugby players. I've always said that you could put a New Zealand grandmother in an all-black jersey and she'll give you a hard time because that's just the way they are in New Zealand. 
The second test saw the Wallabies face a combination of the returning Cavaliers and the Baby Blacks, rewarded for their sterling efforts in the first test. Clearly, when you're selecting All Black side, you select the best. Otherwise, you're failing in your duty as a selector. So we, as selectors, sat down and, and, and selected what th we thought was the best team available in New Zealand, which included many of the Cavaliers, of course, and a few of those the baby blacks who had played in those two tests while they were unavailable. Certainly the hardest two tests for me to captain were those last two tests. Uh, and again, it wasn't because anyone was particularly unsupportive or particularly anti. It was just that it, was just, it wasn't the normal uh, unifying force of the All Blacks. There were really two teams being jammed together. And it really you know, it was, was too much to ask. I think it would have been hard for any captain to lead the side. Um, you're damned if you did, and damned if you didn't, so to speak. Uh, David Kirk, who was starting out in his All Black career, who turned down the Cavaliers tour, so caused a bit of friction in the last minute. Um, you know, anyone could decide what they wanted to do, but there was a bit of animosity that side of it, and trying to go forward from there. So it, it wasn't a real cohesive, happy camp, to be honest. We had a um, there was a move down the uh, blind side. I remember that very well. John Kerwin and I cooked it up. And it was always from a scrum close to the line on the right-hand touch line. And because he was so strong, I'd pass him the ball and he would cut back in and close to the line he'd always bring his winger with him. Loose forwards would arrive and I'd double around him. So he th threw the ball over the top out of the tackles and I'd take the ball and score in the corner. Working Australia back, John Kerwin short side. This is the move they call Murden. Kirk Behind so early in the second test and the Wallabies' chance to grasp back the cup was slipping away. You know, we didn't play well in the first half, I must say. And, um, but that didn't bother me because the game was 80 minutes and I just sort of tried to settle them down at half time. We weren't allowed on the paddock then. You're allowed to meet the players now. It was illegal to send notes on, but I didn't worry about any of that. And I would send one of the reserves on with a written pad of stuff. Not a lot, but key things. And the key one there was, hey, let's start again. Forget the score, start again. We're better than these people. You're making them look as though they're the winners. Just start again. Forget them, forget everything. Just think of the training. Let's do it the way we train to do it. Down the blind side and keep it tight. They've got to use Campisi. Bar Jones, still going. Tyneman, it must be a try. Miller. Then this marvellous try by Tyneman. You know, 15 yards to the right of the posts. And this foolish Derek Bevan, who subsequently apologised and conceded it was a try, said there were too many hands on the ball. There was regrounded the ball over the line, but there were too many hands on the ball. Uh, do you see a certain irony in the 13-12 scoreline? Four consecutive one-point tests. It's got to tell you something about the two sides. David, it's going to be a great game in Auckland. It sure is, yeah. David, I think you need some treatment there. Uh, Your nose looks about nor nor west to me. <laughs> thanks, Keith. <laughs> okay, well done. Thanks very much. Bye. Andrew Slack, thanks for coming and joining us. Uh, big disappointment, obviously, for the Australians today. Sure. Yeah, we wanted to wrap it up, and we didn't, so there you go. Uh, what do you think was the, the reason that uh, Australia was unable to score a try? Because you really did hammer at things for certainly the last part of the game. No, oh, we made mistakes, as, as David said, and uh, particularly in the first 20 minutes where we uh, we just didn't, I don't know, we weren't composed and we weren't disciplined and uh, we lost it in that first 20 minutes, probably lost it in the first minute, really. And then uh, I, I don't think, without making excuses, it was obvious from both sides, just balls as, was as slippery as... Uh, we ever had to play with and a lot of times we made little breaks and the ball just sort of spewed forth, you know, and couldn't maintain continuity. Andy, what about that, uh, the incident late in the game when the two loose forwards, Tyneman and Miller, went for the ball? How do the boys feel about that there? It's on the, mo it's on the monitor there for us well, near the end of the game. It looks... Well, let's have a look. I've, I was blinded by it, but it looks like a try to me. Yeah, I think it looks like a try to a lot of people. Uh, Andrew, did you see a certain irony in that 13-12 scoreline? It's all tied up there very close. No, I don't really care about the scoreline. OK, Andrew, good luck and thanks for joining us and uh, good luck for Auckland. Thank you. We also felt that had we won that second test, the series was over, we were one, and it was knees up Mother Brown for a fortnight as opposed to two weeks of training before the third test. And I was going to ski for the first time in my life and I still haven't. You can't escape the conclusion that the only thing you get without hard work is failure. So to imagine we were going to succeed without hard work would be create a false premise in the minds of the players. So. We trained the next morning and Topo was throwing up because they'd had a big night out, but they were all there at 8 o'clock. We'd never trained at 8 o'clock in our lives. So that was a signal to them that we were really serious and had to be immediately switched on. Alan Jones was a fantastic motivation tool for the All Blacks. Look, you blacks know nothing about courtesy. I have constantly... Is that on or off? On. Well, could you turn it off, please? The guy obviously is very good at getting the best out of his team. Well, this practice is just not going on. This is absurd.
He was great for the Wallaby team, but also I think he could have been a thorn in the side sometimes because he helped us in our motivation. Right, well, I'll be having something to say to your editors tonight as well. In the all-important series-deciding third test, the Kiwis tried to pull a fast one. This must be, almost be a try to Bonica. In the third test, they surprised us. They led us to believe that they were going to play a pretty tight, typical sort of forward orientated New Zealand style of rugby. And uh, right from the kickoff, Fran Obotica and co um, just ran the ball at us. Um, never seen it before. The Australians had a very good pack, a very settled pack. Well, nothing wrong with our pack either, but we had players in that pack that were good ball players. And if we could uh, get the ball um, moving out wide and come back through our forwards and, and uh, open the play up a little bit, we, we thought we had a good chance of beating Australia that way. They'd been beaten in the first test and beaten in the second, so what are they going to do? So we'll try and take them on early. And I mean, they, you know, they got a lot of ball, which was, it, we didn't surrender any. It was, they were just things that happened. And somehow or other, we weren't getting the ball and they had this gut full of it. It was tapped sideways, referee lets it go. Botica, Stone. Inside is Bodiger. Now it's Kerwin. Dazzling running from the All Blacks. Hickory. 22 metre line, Australia. Bodiger again to Stanley. Crowley's in. Craig Green tripped over his man. If you don't score points when you actually are in, in control or in those attacking and scoring positions, you can bet your boots they're going to have the same period of attack. If you don't score tries and they do, you lose the game. Brewer, two from the back, taken by Cutler, great take. He slips the ball back for the Australians. Liner to Pepworth, here's Burke, Liner, Pepworth! Brett Pepworth, must be a try if he can pick it up, Leeds. He's going for the line, he's there in his first test. Kirk is there, and now it's Craig Green. Slack, the tackler. Clever play by Green. Leeds did well. Wetton. The ball being kept alive by New Zealand. Here they go again. Overlap. Stone. Crowley's outside. Kerwin. New Zealand still charging ahead. Brewer. Just short. I saw that I wasn't right on the Ingle line. So I turned around, and as I turned around, I saw Hickory that was charging up with the ball. Going towards that line, and I see AJ Wetton on the ground and the ball there, and like, uh, I'm thinking to myself, this, this could be the try. I'm in here. Unfortunately, I, I felt myself sort of, you know, flying through the air. I think he got a real shock of his life. Rodriguez made that phenomenal tackle, which changed the psychological thrust of our side. Rule him unfit. Here's Stone. Trying to work a loop. Australia could score if New Zealand aren't careful. Here they go. Far Jones. Overlap for Campisi. He's there! Australia has won the cup. David Campisi is overjoyed. in the Australian team. Campisi hasn't seen the ball today, but that makes it all worthwhile. Let us look up. Belongs to the Wallabies. Ladies and gentlemen, three cheers for Australia. Out of the Grand Slam and winning the Bledisloe Cup in New Zealand, unquestionably, the harder thing to do is to win the Bledisloe Cup in New Zealand. The Bledisloe Cup was meant for trans-Tasman competition between touring sides. The real test is beating New Zealand in New Zealand at the end of a tour, where they built the tripe out of you every Wednesday, and I mean that, and kicked the tripe and built the tripe out of you. And you've got to survive that, and you've got to win again on Saturday, and you've got to win two or three tests. I think um, for those, in the forwards in particular, a bigger achievement than, than the Grand Slam, which, which is a big thing to say, but it was one word, respect which um, set the, the standard, and we got respect.
To this point, world champions was an unofficial barroom bragging rights kind of thing. That is, until the real deal, the first Rugby World Cup, was created from almost nothing and staged in Australia and New Zealand in 1987. There was a crisis brewing in world rugby that the Northern Unions couldn't really see. They seemed to think the game would and could continue unaltered forever. It took the rugby heavyweights of Australia and New Zealand, putting in what rugby people refer to as some very hard yards, to get official International Rugby Board approval. When the tournament arrived, the Australians were favourites. They'd won the Grand Slam in 1984. They'd defeated New Zealand in New Zealand in 1986. They were already unofficial world champions. They just needed the World Cup to be a kind of coronation ceremony, where the crown could be safely installed upon their sweaty head. For all that, the Australians' preparations were not going well. The 87 World Cup, when we first met, uh, Alan said this is just a tour. The only difference is that we're at home. Um, in the end, it didn't quite work like that uh, because it's impossible to pretend something is when it isn't. When a side goes away on tour, we normally, it doesn't matter where it is in the world, you normally train in the morning, get it over and done with, have lunch and then have the afternoon off to do what you want to do. But the problem came when, when Alan Jones signed a contract with um, 2UE, I think it was at the time, and his contract stipulated that he had to work the morning show. So we, everything was pushed back to the afternoon. To me, that showed that um, we had to obey the touring rules and we couldn't go to work. We weren't allowed to go and work if we wanted to, but Alan could. And the problem in all rugby sides, it's never an us and, us and them. It's we. You're either all in or you're all out. Sydney players went to work just as I went to work. I mean, it wasn't as though that I was sort of... Uh, knowing me, no one would ever believe that I'd put my work ahead of, my, ahead of the team. I never put anything ahead of the team. They came first, but that was the deal. But I know there has been this misconception over time, and I've been blamed for that, and I'll wear that. One of the difficulties is that a few of us were working. I mean, Alan said no work, but, I mean, at some of days, I had a legal firm to get to. I had, you know, 25 files to, to attend to. Um, I had nothing better to do in the morning, so I'd get up at five in the morning and I'd disappear. Um, I remember Alan called me once during the World Cup at seven o'clock, you know, it was in his news break, called me on my direct line. Um, I shouldn't have picked it up. <laughs> I didn't know it was him. <laughs> but obviously I got, uh, I got, in, in no uncertain terms, told that I, sh I was told not to be there. And as I think in retrospect, well, why didn't I say, well, where were you when you called me? The Australians, though unconvincing during their pool matches, turned on a fantastic display to defeat Ireland in the quarter-final. They then faced the French for their chance to play in the inaugural Rugby World Cup final. Desperate defence. France getting closer. Coca went high. France have taken it. This could be a try. It is! Alain Laurier has scored. His third try in a test match. Liner steps beautifully. He's got Far Jones in his pocket. Greg Campisi, he's there. That's the world record. Australia back in the lead. Nashiske on the first bounce. Blanco says to kick it downfield. Campisi's back there. This is dangerous with the ball bouncing around. Oh, what a horrible mix-up. France could score. Who's there? Pascal Onda. Now they set it to Rodriguez. Charles I can remember, you know, after a good period of people not saying anything, um, just sitting there, just knowing that our dreams of participating in the final of the World Cup against New Zealand had gone and uh, opportunity lost. And at one stage, good 15, 20 minutes afterwards, uh, I think Alan Jones said, would somebody turn the goddamn showers on to make some noise in here? Which sort of broke the ice a little bit, but people just didn't want to be spoken to. Um, we were all desperately disappointed and we all knew it and no, you know, nobody had to say anything. It was the first ever World Cup and, you know, you're a, a smell away from playing in the final and 
you know, I guess in a sense you'd wish you'd been flogged as opposed to just been beaten in the last minute. Alan Jones blamed me for the loss uh, against the Frogs. Um, and I was quite happy to accept that. I can carry that burden. Um, but I did ask him if he could carry his responsibilities for the World Cup and left it to that. So over the years, you know, there's been a bit of animosity amongst players with Alan and all that sort of... I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's a game of rugby. And sure, we should have been able to, to uh, uh, overcome, I suppose, and get, get to where, if we were good enough. French were better, and that's the way it is. The defeat shattered Jones. He had to be coaxed from his room to continue training for the third versus fourth playoff, a match nobody wanted to play. The Wallabies had begun to disintegrate. It was an unhappy, from my point of view, it was an unhappy environment. Um, and so I thought, well, what's the point of being here? Um, and so that was 87 from a start back in 78. I played New Zealand, we'd won and lost against New Zealand, played against all the countries and won and lost against all the countries. So I thought, well, I've got better things to do than this at the moment. So I just walked over the Oval and said, Alan, I'm, I'm going. He said, oh, OK, see, so I said, no, you don't understand, I'm going home. And uh, he said, no, you can't. He said, we've got to, I said, no, you don't understand. I am going home. I've got my ticket. Uh, I wish you the very best of luck over in New Zealand. There's nothing I can do for you over there. I said, I'm going home. See you later. Where for Australia things should have been rosy and weren't, the opposite was the case for New Zealand. Leading into the World Cup that had a loss to Australia and to France, the wounds of the cancelled South African tour and the subsequent Rebel Cavaliers were still raw and fresh. And yet, they were travelling pretty well. I think that out of that that 86 year was the makings of 87. I think that, you know, it was pretty apparent that we needed to, to get together and get together quickly. Um, that a whole lot of guys had also been blooded that we may not have looked at at all um, in 87. They'd been blooded in 86. And so a mixture of the old and the new, you know, really got together. Um, um, and, and, you know, Brian Lahore, Alex Wiley, John Hart formed a very good triumvirate of, of people. And they worked out you know, how they wanted to play the game internationally, you know, what was the All Black style going to be leading into the World Cup and the future, and then decided, well, this is how we want to play it, let's go out and find the players that can play it that way. So they changed the mould completely. And we, we felt there was only one way that we could win the World Cup, and that was play expansive rugby. Our forwards were not physically big enough to guarantee um, even parity. We certainly weren't going to guarantee that we'd beat Australia up front France up front or England up front. So clearly we had to look at another way of doing things. Oh, it was fantastic. You know, the team really, it's sort of hard to explain. There's, there are no easy explanations. The team just really gelled, you know, became an extremely powerful unit, scrummaging, tight play in general, and the loose forwards with uh, Jones and Wetton and Shelford were just absolutely dominant. Uh, and then you had sort of Kirk, Fox, Taylor, Stanley, Green, Kerwin and Gallagher, which was a, which was a, a back line that worked in, in all dimensions. Winning might be everything to a sportsman, but winning with style is great for the fans. And the way they tell it, it might even have worked to repair the spirit of a country after half a decade of conflict and controversy. Not just winning, but winning with style. 22 metre line. Jones looking for his second. Kirk! David Kirk! Cordonier has just walked past and said, that is the finish. Kirk has gone straight through, only Serge Blanco in front. The support can't keep up with him. Now they arrive, Shelford, lovely pass to Kerwin. Another one for New Zealand. And the Webb Ellis Cup, the inaugural World Cup, has gone to this marvellous New Zealand side. You feel representative of the uh, of the All Black history, and you feel as if you're representing those players to some that have gone before, to an extent. So you feel you feel grateful to be part of that tradition, uh, and also you know pleased to be able to represent it uh, and holding up the cup. Here was a chance. Everyone uh, in the same tournament at the same time, the winner was without doubt the best. So that was, that was a big thing for me and for a lot of players to be able to show that we were the best. 
Just a few weeks after the World Cup, the relentless struggle between Australia and New Zealand resumed. There was a one-off Bledisloe Cup match in Sydney and the Kiwis were not impressed. We felt that the, the title of you know, newly crowned world champions was on the line really quickly. Um, and perhaps we would like to, you know, a few months to not have to front up again, um, but we did have to front up pretty quickly afterwards. For us to be, have an opportunity to play that one-off Bledisloe was sort of, right, once, once we beat these guys, um, we are the world champions. And um, so we were, we were pretty intent on, on making sure that we played well in that game. Jones and Cody right up the back. Far Jones got that one away well. But Michael Jones has spoiled. This is Pierce. Fitzpatrick! I felt we always had the edge, but we, um, we finally got ahead into the second half. Uh, and then I made a mistake, actually, ran the blind side. Another good New Zealand scrum, Shelford to Kirk. Charge down, Patworth! Red Patworth chased by Jones, and it's a try! Sensational! Well, I'd put us behind again after all this hard work. But then it was really from then that that team, and it was a great team, just started to up, up the tempo, cut the mistakes down and grind it out. Kirk has it. Stanley. Taylor loops. Gallagher. Back to Taylor. Kerwin's outside. And St John has scored his 12th try in Test Match Football. We talk about winning the World Cup was great, and it was fantastic memory and experience, but the players got just as much going to Concord in 87, you know, a month or two after that, and playing that Wallaby game. One off, it was a hard game, and we went away in the last 10 minutes and won the game, and that was, the euphoria in the team was fantastic. And from that, our sort of era went from there, knowing every time we are playing Australia, um, albeit sometimes we got a bit close, um, we knew we had the wood on them. And it was exciting, and it was great, great feeling. Later that year, Alan Jones led the Wallabies to Argentina. Success again eluded them in the tests and the team, after a series of recent failures, was starting to feel pretty down. The disappointing thing was, I mean, our, we played brilliant football in Argentina. Some of the provincial football was the best we've ever played and some of the training was the best we've ever done. But I, you know, there were always forces marshalled against me because of the kind of person I was and I was fairly outspoken and up front and front door. And, um, so there we are, and that's it. It's, um, it's not a sinecure for anyone, it's not a prize for anyone, it's not the property of anyone. There was a democratic vote, but no one ever rang me to tell me that I hadn't got the job. I, I, to this day, I've never been told that I haven't got the job. How did you find out? Uh, over the radio. I was in a taxi in Brisbane, and it came over on the three o'clock news. And the taxi driver looked at me and he said, isn't that you? Well, I said, actually, I think it is, really. <laughs> I said, I think it is. <laughs> There's a bit of a myth that does the rounds that when the, my first team, test team assembled in 1988 after I regained the coaching position that my opening remarks to the team were, well, as I was saying before, I was rudely interrupted. Bob Dwyer, deposed in favour of Jones in 1984, returned to coach the Wallabies. The team began to look forward again. The next World Cup was only a few years away and the whole team had only one purpose in mind. We certainly had as a goal that we would be very competitive in the World Cup. We, we certainly had as, a, as perhaps a more focused goal that we wanted to be the number one team in the world and we didn't want it to be any later than 1991. All their efforts were directed to that aim. And the Australians knew what the benchmark was. They knew who they had to defeat to know they could defeat anyone, the All Blacks. The team that emerged from the turmoil of the 80s to win the World Cup in 1987 went on to be the most formidable machine in world rugby. Their record of 50 matches, including 23 tests without loss, is unsurpassed and probably unsurpassable. In 1988, Australia faced New Zealand in a three test series. It's the middle test of the series that the All Blacks remember. And they'll be tested here. Far Jones. Williams inside. Williams! Great try! Far Jones, hoisting now for Williams. Pressure on Gallagher. Five metres out. Australia there in numbers. Walker. Lovely pass to Grant. He's there! there now. 
New Zealand looking much better here. Wright follows. Wright and Williams leads. Now Williams back there. He's going to have a run. Straight ahead. Ian Williams. Only one man in front. Shelford. He's still going. Amazing effort there by Williams. And now he tackles on the goal line. Sensational. Australia go. Oh, they've blown a try. After losing by a mere 25 points in the first test, the Wallabies this time were up 16-6 at half-time. The All Blacks, though, went about the task of setting things to rights. Murray Pearce. Schuster. Stanley over that. Terry Wright gets it. Deans to Fox. Schuster. Knocked down by Walker. Fox picks up again. Kerwin. Kerwin! This time! And gets another five metres in field. The guys were pretty gutted. It was a loss as far as we were concerned. You know, we went to win that series 3-0. And um, we couldn't lose the series. But, you know, drawing a series and winning it are two different things. After the shock of the draw, the all-black machine resumed with renewed vigour. It's ever-winning ways. Williams, a great tackle. the stage. The first ten minutes, this scrum will tell a bit of a tale. Well, a punch up there between halfback Robert Jones and Nick Farr Jones. They're all joining in now. It's punches galore. It's an all-in brawl. The match erupting and that was totally unnecessary. Here the Lions threatening to score again. Guscott. He follows. Guscott! Yes! When Australia lost the series to the British Lions, Bob Dwyer decided that things had to change if the Wallabies were to have success in the future. So 1989 became a watershed for the Wallabies. I think we had the better team, the better personnel, but we again didn't deliver the knockout punch. Um, and I just think Bob thought, well look, you know, you guys have promised me a lot. Um, I, I'm not going to trust you anymore. I really think Bob thought that. You know, you guys have said you'll deliver, you've, you've, you've promised that the game will develop, I've given you time. Um, you haven't delivered, so I'm going to go and do it my way. And he largely did. Stalwarts of the team were dropped in favour of youngsters, many with little representative experience, some with none. In the one-off test against New Zealand in 1989, Tony Daly and Tim Horan played their first tests, and a player then more anonymous than a wrong number, one Philip Kearns, was plucked out of the Randwick seconds to run on for the first time for the Wallabies. Shoulders, referee says play on. Now it's Steve Tyneman. Campisi gets around Kerwin. Here they go, Australia. Nick Far Jones. The try's on here. Campisi's there. Campisi! Great try! Australia here must try and win this line out and move the ball across field. It's very easy in hindsight to look at names like Kearns, Horan Little, Daly, Offerhen Galway, um, Mackenzie, Eels, and think, well, what's smart about picking those guys? They're always going to be fantastic. But you've got to remember that Dwyer was picking some of the guys out of second grade for their club, guys who weren't playing provincial rugby. I mean, Horan and Little weren't playing provincial rugby. Um, you know, I met Tony Daly at an airport going to a Bledisloe Cup match. Easy in hindsight when you look at these guys then go on to become superstars. But at the time Dwyer made the hard decisions, um, no one else was picking them. Sitting in the dressing room after the game, sitting next to Tony Daly, and he looked across at me and he said, well, at least we've played one game for Australia. And we thought that was it. We lost the game, lost the, you know, lost the test. Um, we were probably going to be made, or thought we were going to be made the scapegoats. And that was it. Um, we got picked for a couple more after that, thankfully. When Australia next met New Zealand for a three-test series in 1990, the All Blacks had gone an extraordinary 21 tests without loss. Wayne Buck Shelford was undefeated as captain, so his sacking from the team tore the country apart. To this day, you'll see bring back Buck signs held up at sporting venues around the world. New Zealand loved him and they just could not believe that he was gone. Surprisingly, the Wallabies were considered slim favourites for that series. 
And I can affirm from personal experience, little old ladies were stopping wallabies in the street saying, I hope you beat our boys so they'll bring back Buck. It was not to be. That's their line there, Bishop. Fox, Little, tried it again. The tackle that time was off the Hengarway. Fox, Ian Jones. Everyone's handling. Ennis. Has he got it down? Yes, he has. Try it for Craig Ennis. Everyone's organised now. Here we go. Running it wide again. Some people think, uh, thought at the time that we might go into that first test as favourites, but we were, we were certainly not thinking that that we were there yet. Certainly, we thought we were competitive. Certainly, we thought that um, that if everything went right for us, if we played to our best, we might just surprise them. But uh, that wasn't to be, and we we weren't. We weren't great at all. We didn't we didn't play well, and the scoreline reflected the fact that we didn't play well, and we were we were quite decisively beaten to, to such an extent that uh, not for the first time um, the press were uh, unkind uh, to our performance and and virtually wrote us off. Didn't rate us uh, for the future at all. Great Britain to this live telecast Woo! going to you, and it goes to Fox. This is Walter Little, number 12. Here's Innes again. But they're getting across. You see the tackle there. It was number seven, Brendan Nasser. That's the job the Aussies want. But here's Kerwin with the ball. Slipping left by Jones. John Kerwin walking inside. And the tie is scored by Sean Fitzpatrick. And the All Blacks have control of this now. On centre field. Or do, or do they? It's been ripped away, in fact. Kai Jones up to Horan. Now the chase is on. Second test in Auckland. No one gave us a hope in hell. And we came out and we had a guy on the wing called John Flett. And uh, Fletty was an ex soccer player, AFL player, and converted to rugby a few years before and, and made a fist of it. And he nearly scored a try with about three or four minutes to go to, to just about even that game. And it would have been one of the great tries of all time. A line out win for Australia this time. This is Anthony Herbert, straight at Grant Fox and bounces him off. Bar Jones to Horan, away to Flett. Oh, he's through! John Flett! Brilliant try! Great oh, try. try! No! Right at the end, he lost the ball. That would have been a sensational try, but it's no try at all. All Blacks, right in centre field. Basham, out to Kerwin. Instead, New Zealand scored up the other end on sort of a 12-point turnaround. And what what looked uh, on the scoreboard like a bit of a belting uh, was actually a really close game. If we really, you know, everything goes right, um, we're going to be competitive and we can beat these guys. And gradually through that tour, and the results show this, that came. Liner gives it away to Far Jones. Could open up here. Here's Warren. Away to Carozza. Chased by Kerwin. No. Before the game, Sean Fitzpatrick and Gary Wetton said, if it's wet, don't throw to... Don't, and we're hard on our try line, don't do the flat ball to two. And the signal for that was simply a nod of the head. I blame Sean. Sean blames me, actually. <laughs> I got the wink and the, the lift of the eyebrows and Gary Wetton, which meant the, the flat hard ball. And I was thinking, no, no, not here, but the wet ball, you know, could squirt out and make it difficult for us. Sean's going, and Gary's going. So Sean threw it. It was thrown to me, fumbled it, dropped this way. Kunzi, being the snaffle he is there, just sat there and, and plonked over. You know, he said he ran 50 metres, I think he ran about a half a metre. I think it ended up about 50 metres with a chip over the top and a few other things thrown in, but basically I picked it up and fell over. A little bit of blood just above that left eye. Big line out this one. Have a look at this, Gary Whitten got up. Kenzie dived on it and I was sort of at his feet and uh, and I think it was sort of a build up of the last sort of two years really. Um, they did actually got one over us and uh, 
and gave me the two finger salute. The heat of the battle and the fact that Sean had given it to me verbally for every game we played against each other leading into that, um, it was maybe an outpouring of that frustration to finally say something, <laughs> say something back to him. Gary went not It sort of ended into folklore, but it was most unlike me, I must say. I'm normally one of those guys that's, you know, in the sledging, and you think about the comeback about 10 minutes after, and you think, geez, I wish I'd said that. That would have been really funny. To go into a New Zealand dressing room after a match to thank them for the game as the victor is, is perhaps one of the great joys of rugby. It's possibly because it doesn't happen very often. Changing room's pretty quiet afterwards. You go in with a couple, here it is, guys, are you? Thanks. Um, it doesn't mean too much, really. A, we'd lost the game. Um, B, it was to Australia. Or maybe A, it was Australia. B, we'd lost the game. To see the absolute air of despondency and defeat and dejection was, was probably an eye-opener for me uh, and maybe something that we would have to take on board if, uh, if we were going to remain uh, a world force or become a world force and to remain a world force for any length of time. I didn't realise that I wasn't the best hooker in the world. I thought I was the best hooker in the world. And the and, um, and, and same with a number of other players on the team, that we weren't doing that extra work that we should have been doing um, to get back up to where, where we needed to be to, to compete at that level. What better preparation than to thrash Wales and spank England in the lead up to the World Cup? It's what Nick Farr Jones Wallabies did in Australia in 1991. They still had to test themselves against New Zealand, but in Sydney, the Wallabies confirmed that the win the previous year in Wellington was anything but a fluke. They then crossed the Tasman, and in a Doha return match, the Kiwis got one back, proving the Australians shouldn't be complacent. But even that loss had positive and valuable lessons for the Wallabies. I'll never forget the, the absolute sense of relief and joy, not only from the New Zealand supporters, but the actual All Blacks. Then I thought, golly, I mean, these guys are absolutely over the moon of having won this. I mean, previously they'd expect to. They'd think they have a mortgage on those sort of games. So I knew then that, that the momentum had swung our favour and, uh, and this Dublin would be a great opportunity to avenge. The second Rugby World Cup was bigger and better, harder and faster than the first. It was hosted by France and Britain in late 1991. Success for Australia in the early rounds would see them clash against New Zealand in the semi-final on a strange northern battlefield for two such ancient opponents. That stood as the real test of Australia's recent found confidence against the All Blacks. But before that, there was Ireland to get past in the quarter-final. The fiercely partisan Lansdowne Road crowd supporting the hometown lads and disaster looming for the Wallabies. Staples. Clark and Campisi. With Nick Farr Jones injured, Michael Liner was standing in as captain. The Wallabies only had a few minutes left in the match. Was it to be a repeat of 1987? when Australia had failed at the top of the home straight. When that try was scored, I didn't think, well, we're still going to win this. I'm thinking, oh, my God, return trip home tomorrow. And then uh, as the seconds ticked away and they were lining the kick up, uh, the, the conversion kick up, certainly all the talk on the bench uh, was, we've got enough time. In a lot of these situations, people start sort of saying, don't panic, you know, don't do this, don't do that, you know, don't worry. Um, they're all negative um, information, so I took um, all that negative out and said, this is what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, we'll kick off long, we'll get the line out, win the line out ball, and we'll do something out in the backs, get the ball to the backs, and we'll, we'll sort it out from there. I loved his uh, final direction to the team, nobody kick the ball. And that's a uh, key thing. If you're behind and you must score, you must keep the winning of the game entirely in your own control, I believe. That was a game, when you look back in your career, if you were to pick one game, if you could change one moment, 
you would certainly change the last minute of that game. Michael Liner and Horan. Campisi, little as hell without the ball. Campisi! Liner! Yes! yes! When Australia scored, it is almost as if somebody had pressed the pause button on a video. I mean, there was just nothing. Everybody just were vacant stares. That Irish game really gave us the impetus to, you know, when we needed to, we could do just about anything, that team. And, uh, and that last four minutes showed that, you know, we, we, we could up the, up the gears a few and, and pull something out when needed to be. The newspapers were saying, well, this is the... Uh, and all the media, in fact, were saying that the real final is uh, next week, Australia versus New Zealand. We were certainly n not of that opinion, but we knew it was our next final. I think it was a really unique experience after playing New Zealand so many times, to play New Zealand uh, out, of, out of New Zealand, out of Australia, neutral ground, the whole world watching, and this was like, you know, phrase your alley. It was just like the, the heavyweights, the big, the big fight. Our preparation during that week was absolutely focused, absolutely determined. Players were on edge, a couple of minor stouches at training. So we knew that things were probably not going too bad. We knew that everyone was, didn't have their minds on anything but, uh, but winning that game. And we thought that we could do it. We knew it was tough. We knew we had to play to our very best in order to do it, but we believed we could do it. And. Um, in what was probably one of Australia's greatest ever halves of halves of rugby, the, the, our first half against New Zealand semi-final in uh, in uh, 1991 was a great display of rugby. Here's the ruck ball for Australia. Here they go, Campisi. It must be yes. Here's Campisi. The bounce important. That first 40 minutes, it's often been said, but it's got to be said again. I mean, it was almost faultless rugby. I mean, for the first 25, 30, our control, our minimisation of errors, our utilisation of ball in, you know, in, in possession, and then, and then the last 10 minutes when the blacks threw everything at us, um, you know, to try and get that vital score before half time, and the defence, you know, again, that sort of nothing's coming through, whatever it takes. Uh, it, it was it was great to be part of that team. This time it was the All Blacks who fell at the penultimate hurdle. The whole land of the long white clouds started to turn thunderous and the search for answers began immediately. A lot of the blame seemed to focus on the unusual decision by the New Zealand Rugby Union to appoint co-coaches for the tournament. They, they'd had reports that Alex Wiley was losing his touch and losing the confidence of the players and if they thought that, they should have replaced him. They didn't replace him. What they said was that for the World Cup, he would go to the World Cup as a co-coach with John Hart. Well, you can't have co-coaches. Somebody has to be in charge. You have to be a blind man to see that there wasn't the, quite the same harmony there with, with, with those two guys, um, and that reflected into the team, because you can't get away from that. Um, is that the reason we, won, we didn't win the World Cup? No, it's not. Um, but it didn't make it easy, that's for sure. In terms of pressure, the Prime Minister once said to me, he said, when the All Blacks win, I'd like to be the All Black captain, but when they lose, I'd much rather be the Prime Minister of New Zealand. <laughs> the Australians were in the final of the Rugby World Cup, and the redoubtable David Campisi set about talking England out of playing their natural game. You know, there was a lot of talk about the you know, England being talked into trying to run the ball because Bob Dwyer and David Campisi had this press campaign the week before about saying boring England and, you know, they never run the ball and all this sort of thing. And gosh, heavens knows why they, why, why they listened. Um, my recollections of the meetings were, this is what we're going to do, let's do it, and we're all happy. Now, if people weren't happy about it, they didn't make themselves known um, about the tactics. They were in a no-win situation and the press had just built this up, so we just fed them. They can't run, they can't. So, you know, they try to run it and, again, why change your game plan for one game? You know, if they actually played 10-man rugby, they probably would have beaten us. The way we played in the final 
tactics or not, we didn't play well, ultimately, which is why we lost the game. England had, had managed to win their way into the final via the toughest of routes, ran second in their pool after defeat in the opening match by New Zealand, then beat France in Paris, then beat Scotland in Edinburgh. In the match, England did spread the ball wide and yet failed to capitalise. When the chance came, though, the Wallabies took it with both hands. I remember the try distinctly. Rod McCall called the, the line out, uh, the ball be thrown to Willie O. Now, a five throw, when Willie stood at five in the line out, a five throw was really difficult in those days when there was no lifting or anything like that. And here's Rod McCall. He hadn't called it once in the tournament or even probably that year, I don't think he'd even called it. Really tough throw, and it just bangs straight on the money. I knew there was going to be a blue <laughs> who actually had scored it. And I looked up at the referee and I said, who scored it? And he said, both of them. I said, no, but who scored it? And he said, give them two points each. And I went down in the history books as Tony Daly, but the official refereeing decision was, uh, was two points each in the, in the days of the four-point try. Towards the end of the game, with us leading by six points, England broke away um, and looked certain to score. And um, John Eels, a young man, his first serious year of senior rugby, made a fantastic cover defending tackle, which without which I'm sure we, we wouldn't have won the World Cup. Certainly Rugby World Cup is the pinnacle now. You know, winning Tri-Nations, winning one-off New Zealand Test for Bledisloe is, is always special, and you always remember those years. But Rugby World Cup is our Olympics, and as a young boy, I always wanted to be in the Olympics. For the Australians, winning was the ultimate reward for the team's old guard. Veterans like Far Jones, Liner, Campisi and Poitivan were crowned world champions after years of endeavour. And the new guard was there too. The players that would be the backbone of the team for years to come. Kearns, Horan, Little and Eels. The Bledisloe Cup's not the World Cup and to an extent has been outshone by it. But the wrestle for dominance in the Trans-Tasman competition is what's produced the world's two best rugby teams. After two World Cups, the score was even. One World Cup each. And the struggle continued. <laughs>